let's go ahead and kick it off. What did we learn yesterday? Other than lots of progress and lots of project ideas. Any light bulb moments with JavaScript? Were there any terms that we learned? Were there anything, any things that stuck out from our first little project that we did? We learned I can do. A dynamic. Oh, sorry, Corwin, go ahead. We we decided to speak at the same time. My bad, though. Uh, I was gonna say like the input box and like the value and like seeing how it went from just kind of just recognizing that something was there to actually and like taking in the information that you put in that was pretty cool absolutely yeah so we we start to see does anyone remember what that term is when we interface between our javascript and our html dom the dom the document object model right so we think about the document being our HTML document, right? That's the, the content, that's the structure, that's what's showing up on our, our browser. The object is what we're using in JavaScript, just like how we can make objects of our own. Basically all of that HTML document can be mapped in to this object that we interact with. So we use dot value and dot inner and HTML, and we'll see more ways of, of uh, interacting with the DOM as we go. Um, and then we, um, we have the model, right? So understanding that this is two-way communication. Um, so it's not only used for getting text outside of our HTML, it's also used for updating that HTML from our JavaScript and putting things into it. Um, so we touched on document get element by ID, right? Because we have this big HTML document and we don't want the whole thing. We want to just be able to target one little piece of it and then work with that HTML element. So document is giving us access to all the HTML and then we're using a method or a function built into the document object model called get element by ID. Um, we, uh, learned that, uh, as I pointed out, that we commonly see JavaScript in the browser. That's the most common place we see JavaScript run. We started actually in Node, just so we had a little playground so we could run our JavaScript code. Um, just because it's commonly seen, though, in the browser doesn't mean that it's only in the browser, right? We'll be learning um, JavaScript not only in React, which will run in the browser, uh, but we'll be seeing JavaScript once we get to server side and how we build our own API. APIs. But that script tag kind of unlocks a new world of possibilities because that's what's marrying our HTML with our JavaScript together. Um, Taylor, I'm glad to hear that the, the JavaScript running in the HTML was a click moment to see that coming together. Um, and Jen, I'm sorry that Zoom is being a little pain in the ass. Uh, Goggin, what's up? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I got the concept of this list uh, and, you know, putting the list together, mm -hmm. but the, the ally and the UL list is kind of confusing me a little bit. How does it know to put an ally? Before. Yeah, so we didn't cover that in class. So hold off on on asking questions until we actually go over it, because there's a reason I didn't do that at the end of class last night, right? That's the complicated enough topic that we want to like work our way up to it. So if it's still not making sense uh, by the end of or, you know, when we go over it during class, we ask that question. And Brandy, I'm glad to hear that seeing it in use is helpful. The good news is, is that you've got three more weeks of this, right? So we just do project after project after project. So we're going to wrap this one up. Then we're going to move on to building a little calculator in the browser, right? And that's when our HTML can come back to haunt us if we're not familiar with it. Um, but that's when we're going to build our own little interface and then say, all right, what's it take to make this calculator work? So that's the next uh, the next project that we're going to be working on as soon as we finish up that to-do list. Um, 
Plus, you mentioned updating HTML with inner HTML. That's another document object property um, where we are um, able to say, hey, take this string, take this part of the JavaScript and put it back into our HTML. And that's kind of cool because we see the equal side of either operator working, right? We see what we're targeting the dot inner HTML property of that, and then the equal sign and whatever's going on the right is what we're now storing inside that inner HTML. Tara, you had a question, go ahead. Um, It's not really specific to yesterday, but overall, like the class overall, um, Law & Order had a, a episode last week where they had like, um, where the guy was like building a website, et cetera. And they showed like clips of the code and I could actually like read and under like stand, understand some of the code. So I just thought that was cool. Cause I'm like, oh, wow. Like that's not anything I would have normally paid attention to like during the episode. You're a but real nerd now when you pause it <laughs> and you're like, I wonder what language they're <laughs> writing in. Yes, that is, uh, that is definitely a freeing moment. And I also love when um, you'll see like they do that in a TV show and they're like, I'm hacking into the mainframe. And then all they have is like CSS on their, their screen with like margin top. And it's like, I don't think you're getting into any mainframe with a little bit of CSS. So, uh, sometimes it's accurate. Sometimes it's not. Um, but yes, it's, it's always funny, um, to, to see what, what they're using or what, uh, you know, what the, the experts they consulted with said to put on the screen for that clip. All right. Anything else from yesterday? Any light bulb moments that anyone wants to share? Any questions? We are going to go um, back over. We're going to do like a quick review of the code as we have it. We're going to finish it up by just making it show up as a bullet point, and then maybe we'll come back to this project later on and talk about how to make it work so we could actually cross an item off the list. Putting that one on pause, this is actually a newer project, this cohort. Um, last cohort, I taught how to make a tip calculator and a regular calculator. And I got some feedback of that's kind of redundant. Um, so instead, we're doing this to-do list. We're going to build the calculator. And then depending on how much time we have, we may come back to this to talk about data structures and how we can add in functionality by using concepts like an array and a for loop and stuff like that. So um, that is uh, that is definitely a possibility that we come back to this. Um, Mo, glad I'm glad that you saw some light bulbs for your capstone, right? That is exactly what we want to see, right? The the best uh, capstones are the ones where people are like just waiting until eight thirty because all they want to do is switch to their capstone and start start putting in code there and start working on those features. So um, that may not come to you guys for a week or two. That may click tonight. That is totally okay. And if you get to the end of the week and you're like, I have no idea how to apply any of this into my capstone, that's fine too, right? Shoot me a Slack message, schedule a one-on-one. -on -one. We can work with you on that. We ready to dive back into a quick review? All right. So I happen to have my code still open from last night. So if you would like to open your code, go ahead and do that. I'm also going to dump a live share in the chat and I will go live. And this is where we left off. Do you want us to create a day two folder or just keep we're going gonna, because we're so close to finishing this one up, I'm going to leave this one in day one and then we'll start day two for the browser calculator uh, that we're going to start right after this one. Good question. Thank you for asking, though. Yeah, so we will be creating a day two, but because we're only a couple lines away from finishing this one up, um, I'm not going to I'm not going to bother. Okay, so in order to review this code, um, it's not only a good review for you guys to make sure that you're getting the concepts, but um, at the end of the workday, I'm tired, I close out of everything, I go to bed, and when I get up in the morning, I'm looking at this code, and I'm like, who in God's name wrote this? I don't remember how any of this is working, right? 
And so I spend the good, I don't know, 30 minutes it takes me to drink my coffee, uh, often getting back into where I left off, right? Figuring out, hey, what's going on here? And one of the best things you can do for yourself is actually leave yourself a note um, the night before so that when you come in in the morning, you remember, hey, what was I working on? Where did I leave this off? So it would actually have been helpful last night for us to come down here and say, leave ourselves a little note, say, um, left off, uh, input, inputted value in text box is showing up, but it's not in a list and it overwrites when, when we add a new value. Let me just split this into multiple comments there. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, where we left off was, hey, I came up here, I type in something like test, I click add item, test shows up like it should. But now when I come down here and I do a new one, uh, and I say ABC, now only ABC is showing up. It's not showing up in a bulleted list, which is something that I want. And it's also not collectively showing up. Every time I add a new item, it's wiping out whatever that last one is. Okay, that's great. Now I know where we're headed next, but sometimes we don't leave ourselves a note. Sometimes we forget what code we wrote and it's important to be able to go back through. Remember, our code working is not enough. When you get hired for a job, they're not going to just ask you to turn in some code. They're going to say, hey, explain this code to me. Or while you're developing the code, can you explain it? Because oftentimes uh, writing the code and having it work isn't enough. You want to you want to prove that you understand that, that you have the knowledge of the code, that you can uh, explain what the computer is doing. And so the way I like to do this is add numbered steps to my code. So you'll see that this is a practice that as we get into more and more uh, advanced code, you're going to see me adding more and more, not only comments to my code, but step by step, what is the computer doing in order for this thing to work? So that's how I'm going to do my review for class tonight. How did we build this? Well, number one, we came in here and we said, make make a new input for uh, the task text, okay? HTML, input tag, we've seen before, that makes it so we can click in here, we can start typing something, everything's good. Then number two, we added a button that um, triggers add, item function in JavaScript on click. Now you may be looking at that and being like, okay, I don't, I, that's not how I would have said the sentence. I would have said this a little differently. That's okay. Feel free to add your own comments to this in your own words. What I'm trying to say here is we have an HTML button. We've seen buttons before, all of that's fine. But for the first time, we used an on-click. An on-click is uh, called an event in JavaScript. Okay, now we're kind of bridging the gap. We're saying when that button is clicked, what should happen? Well, we call it add item here. So down in our JavaScript, we have our add item down here. And so I am going to say number three, run add item function that got triggered from on click in number two. All right, so we're seeing, hey, why is on click running here? Because we have add item here and add item here. So now these two are linked. Now, how did our HTML, our index.html know that our script.js exists? That is because number four, um, script.js is now, uh, or I should say index.html, 
now knows our JavaScript exists and can run it. This add item isn't going to do anything unless we tell our HTML, heads up, there's some JavaScript that I would like you to run when this page loads. So it's kind of interesting because the computer, when it first loads the script.js, it says, hello world. And then it goes, all right, this add item is a function. I'm not going to do any of this yet until you tell me, hey, go do add item. When do we tell it to do add item? When the button is clicked on, then go run this add item. We get the details of the event that's happening. We're not actually using that yet, but that's a good placeholder to have in there for down the road when we do need it. Okay, now what comes next? Number five, we always take whatever's on the right part of the equal, run that first, and store that in the left part of the equal. So we say using the document object model, using the document keyword, we get the HTML tag with the ID of inputted text. Okay, so document is saying bridge the gap, go back up to our HTML, get element by ID is specifically finding the ID of all of these elements. And then we're telling it as a parameter, go take inputted text and find that input up here. Okay. Then this is going to be continued, then store that HTML element in a new variable called input box. Okay, now the problem is that there's a lot of stuff going on with input box. We could decide, hey, we want to make the input box disappear with CSS styling. Well, we don't. What we care about is number six, log out the value, i.e. the text typed into the box um, from the variable in number five. Okay, so now take input box, which we stored from getting our document, log out the value. We also log out item added. So I don't, I don't think I need to go into detail there. But for number seven, reuse document get element by ID and get the list items div. Okay, well, in order to get list items div, we should say number E make sure list items div exists so JavaScript has a place to put our list. Okay, now we finish it off by saying number eight, uh, number nine, sorry. Now that we have access to the div, take the value from step number five and put it inside the HTML tag from number seven. Okay, so we're saying, hey, get this list items, that's number seven. Then we are saying number nine is once we get these list items, take the input box from number um, five up here and put it inside this list items. And then finally, number 10, clear out the value, i.e. what's typed in to the input box. Okay, take a pause there, give yourself a good literal review and ask yourself, is there any syntax here that I don't understand? Is there any concept here that I don't understand? If I ask you to do this, I'm not going to, but if I ask you to make this from scratch, do you think that you had enough of the concepts 
to say, all right, maybe I don't remember what it's something with document, but I, I don't remember what method it is, right? So it's not, can you make this from scratch? It's, do you, would you know what to Google in order to get something like this to work? Could you say, hey, uh, something with the document keyword, um, it's something with the word element in it. Maybe if I Google JavaScript, how to get text box or how to get input value in JavaScript, that I would be able to see that and maybe read through the answer. Jen, what's up? Are there um, in W3 schools, there are like practice runs of this that we can continue to do over and over and over and over? Yeah, so a couple, couple resources for you. Um, Free Code Camp has a lot of them. Um, if you head to their, um, um, I don't know if they have it in, so do, do they have, Well, that's disappointing. Um, yeah, in W3 schools, if you do um, like doc, uh, if you just do a search for DOM, um, W3 schools has like a whole section on it and then they go into an example. And then from there, um, they've got all of the different like properties and methods and stuff like that. Um, and on any of their code examples, you can hit the try it button. So if you go into the JavaScript forms, um, you can see they've got like the on submit and the try it yourself. Um, and they've got every like examples in here that you can play around with. And we've got three more weeks of class where we're going to be building, we're going to keep on using these concepts. So you'll get a lot more practice there as well. I'm actually a little surprised that. W3 schools doesn't have um, uh, that free code camp doesn't have the document object model. I wonder if that's in another one of their courses. Um, I will look into that and get back to you. Any other questions about what we have working so far before we keep going? I encourage you guys to number out the code. The people who always do the best in the cohort are people who go back at the end of the night and before they sign off, right at the end of class, they go back through and they number all of these steps. And they go, all right, what order is the computer doing this? What order did we write this? Because it's literally one, two, eight, four. Well, that makes no sense. But during class last night, the order that we wrote it made total sense, right? Oh, we need an input. We need a button. We need something to happen when the button gets clicked. What happens when the button gets clicked? We need the input from the text box. What do we do with the input from the text box? We need a div to put that in. Now we need to go get that div in our JavaScript. Now that the div is there, what are we doing with it? We're putting the text into that div. Okay, yes, I said that very annoyingly fast, but I just covered what we did in 45 minutes in 30 seconds. Now, that order made total sense that we were doing it last night, but look at how it manifested in our code. We have one, two, eight, four, and then we've got three, five, six, seven, nine, ten. That is how code happens, right? The order that we write it makes total sense. The order that it executes on the computer side might be different. And so by, by being able to retrace your steps, it makes it much easier to understand what we're trying to get the computer to do at that moment. Okay, so we're gonna finish this off. I'm gonna go back to this note and it says left off inputted value in text box is showing up. It's not uh, in a list and it overwrites when we add a new value to it. Okay. Well, what are we trying, what are we telling the computer to do right here? We're saying take whatever value is inside the input text box and put that inside the inner HTML of our list div. Well, whenever we use this equals as an assignment operator, whenever we say take whatever's on the right and put it in what's on the left, 
whatever was in the left is overwritten. That is now gone. The computer has forgotten about it. We have no way of, of using that old value anymore. So what we could do is we could say, hey, let's say, let's take the uh, new variable and call it current list items. And what our current list items are going to be is whatever is in the list div dot inner HTML. And now what we want to do is not only have this list div inner HTML show the input box value, we also want it to show all the current list items and the input box value. So I'm going to save that. And I'm going to come back over to my browser. And I'm going to say my first item. I'm going to hit add item. There it is. And I'm all nice and happy about that. Like, oh, man, I'm doing good. Let's test it. My uh, second item, I add it. And that's not how I want it to show up. But it's working. And so we pat ourselves on the back. And we go, all right, it's a minor little thing that we got working but it's progress nonetheless. So let's identify the progress. Let's say, yay, we got it working. Now we can fix the other problem, which is, hey, I want this to show up as a bullet point list. Well, how do we do bullet points in HTML? We use the UL tag. And then every time we want a bullet point, we use an LI. So let's just practice with that for a second. You don't have to follow along with me here. But if I create a UL, and I create an li, and I say item number one, and I come down here and I say um, test number two, and I save that, I've got my little bullet point showing up there. So this is the HTML that I'm aiming for. You don't have to add that specific HTML. I just have it there for reference. OK, well, what's going on in my list items? In order for the li to show up, this shouldn't be a div. This needs to be an unordered list. Follow along with me now on this section of the code if you would like this to work in yours. OK, so we change this. This is now no longer a generic div. This is an unordered list. But if I come back over here and say item 1 and item 2, it's now indented like a list. but we are missing these LIs, right? That's how the HTML knows, hey, everything on this list is a separate item. So in order to fix that, what we're going to do is we're going to come down here and say, hey, take whatever the current list items is, and instead of just putting in the input box value, let's put in a string with our LI. Then between that li, we're going to take whatever we typed in to the input box. And then we also need to put in our closing li. I can type. OK, so I come back over here and I say first item. And I hit add item and I go, oh, it's a bullet point there. If I do second and hit add item, ooh, I got another bullet. Now it's like, OK, this is kind of cool. How is this working? We can actually right click, go down to our inspect, and look at our UL. And our UL has list items ignore this marker that says first item and second. Okay, how did we pull that off? Let's review that. We said, hey, take whatever is in the inner HTML of the div right now and store a copy of that in current list items. Then take whatever is currently in the list and concatenate or add to the end of the list another LI tag. 
Now we have to put that in quotes because we're telling the, the computer heads up, the LI tag is a string. That doesn't mean anything to JavaScript, but as soon as that gets into the HTML, the HTML is like, whoa, arrow brackets. I know that's an, a list item, great. Then we take, we switch it back to a JavaScript thing and we say, take that input box value. And then at the very end of it, add on this closing LI tag. So I can now come up here and delete this. However, this is a very common technique to say, I want something in my JavaScript to generate some HTML. So let me go write that HTML first. Let me make sure that it shows up the way that I want it to. And then I can emulate that HTML down here by adding on those list items. So I'm going to just comment this out because this is just our dummy data. But I'll leave a note in here that says example um, list that I want to dynamically generate in our HTML. Okay, this is your last chance for this project to say, dear God, none of it's working, please let me screen share, or to raise your hand if you have a question that you would like me to recover. Because if not, we're gonna push this project to the side and we're gonna build something using all these same concepts but a lot more involved. And if you don't get it on this one, you're not going to get it on the next one. So this is your chance to go through and say, hey, first intro to JavaScript in the browser, am I getting this? So, um, oh, so quote, I'll come to you next. Um, can you go over this just one more time, please? Just to start sure. with from the top to the bottom or just what we added? Just what we added. Okay. So where we left off last night, right, to, to give you context to our starting point, was we had it so that when we type something in and hit add item, we got it showing up in the bottom here, but it wasn't showing up in a list. And that's okay, but the real problem was when I added a second item and hit add item, the first item disappeared and all that showed up was the second item. So in order to fix that, we said, hey, we still need to do all of this work with getting the element of the inputted text. We still need the value. We still need all of that stuff. But what we're going to do is we're going to go to that list div and get out whatever the inner HTML of that list div is at the time of pressing this add item button. And we're going to store a copy of that in this variable called current list items. Then when we are updating our HTML, we're going to change the div up here to a UL so that the, H, the, the browser knows to show up bullet points as an unordered list. That's what the UL stands for, unordered list. Then in our JavaScript, we're going to take whatever was currently in the list items and add on to it a new LI tag. And then between the closing li tag and the opening li tag, we're going to put the input box value. In other words, we're generating some HTML here, a new li tag with uh, the content of that text box in between the li's. Then we're taking not only the current list items, but the new list item that we've added onto it and putting that inside our list div, which is our UL up here, and targeting the inner HTML of that list. I think where I'm getting a little confused is uh, in the in code line number 19, if on the left side, we replace list div dot inner HTML with current list items, so the line says current list items equals current list items plus li some some. Will that work? Yes. Um, we're basically saying um, make whatever the current list items are equal to the current list items plus a new list item at the end. Okay, understood. So you. you could skip. If this is confusing you, pause for a second. But you could 
just do this without that the, the need for another variable. Okay, understand. And that would totally work. I, I like doing it like this to make it a little bit more explicit of saying, hey, take the inner HTML and save a copy of it and then add on to it and then put that back into the dip. Nope, I get it now. Thank you. Yeah. The quota, talk to me about where you're getting lost. Ooh, the question is where I'm not getting lost at. Um, I guess, like I said, it could be just the terminology that I'm just struggling with. So, like, I guess I'm not understanding, like, um, like, I understand the list, that whole part that you just did. Mm -hmm. But I guess I'm not understanding the, like, okay, so you put the, like, the input, the input text, and then, like, the input box that value, like, I'm trying to, yeah, I'm confused there. So, okay. like, when you did. So, back it up a step, right? Pretend like this JavaScript doesn't exist at all. If we want a new input box to show up, we've seen input tags before, right? That input works. Then we come down here and we say, all right, the button. We've done buttons before. That gives it the little gray box. All of that's fine. Now we say, okay, we have crossed the big divide. Our HTML is now done. We need some way to say, hey, I want this interactive thing to happen. I want some new thing to show up on the page, or I want to tell the computer how a, a list works, how we build a list. That's when we add this on click. The on click is what's saying now head over to our JavaScript and whatever comes between the opening curly brace of the, the add item and the closing curly brace, all of that code is going to run when that button is clicked on. So that's when we switch back over to our JavaScript. And in our JavaScript, we're aligning this um, add item with this function called add item. So our JavaScript is like, great. Now I know to go run anything between this curly brace and this curly brace, what do you want me to do? How do I add an item to the list? So think about this, take a step back and say, hey, if I hire you as my assistant and I say, hey, make a new to-do list for me. You're like, okay, great. Well, what's the first thing that you would ask them? Well, what's the thing that you want to add to the list? Well, that's what they're typing in here. And then they, at the end, they're saying, okay, I'm done with that item. Add that item to my list for me. Now we pause and we go into the JavaScript side of things. And we say, all right, in order for me to be able to add that item, to actually write that item down on your list, I need to know what the name of that item is. So this get element by ID inputted text is actually what's going back into our index.html, finding the inputted text and giving us access to the input itself. Now that we've got that input, there are a bunch of different things that we could do with that input. We could hypothetically in our JavaScript, don't follow me here, but just as an example, we could say, take the input box and target the CSS styling of it and set the display of it to none. Well, now I come over here and I go, ha ha, no more tasks. And I hit add item. And boom, my box is gone. Now that's really dumb. We don't actually want it to do that. But if we wanted to say, hey, this list can only have 10 items in it. And after the 10th item, make that disappear. We could do that. What we're doing in here instead is saying, hey, we the input box has all of this HTML stuff going on with it. 
we don't want all of the HTML. We want the value of what was typed in to that box. Now that we've got that value, what are we need? What are we doing with it? Well, we pulled it out, but we need to put it back into another section of our page. So we use this same document .get element by ID, but what we do is we reach in to this UL now, and we're we're hooking our JavaScript into this UL, and then from there, that's when we say take whatever is inside that UL and add on to the end of it a new list item that has the value from the input box that we got all the way up here on line seven. And then finally, we, get, we go back to the value and we say, take whatever was in the value, we don't care what got typed in, set it back to empty. Okay. Did I lose you at a step? Um, or... No, I, Go I, think it's, I think it's becoming clear to me now. Um, but I did want to ask about the, um, the I just want to go back to the HTML part. Yeah. Where the button on click at item event, like do we have to add that event part in? That's a really good question. Um, let's find out. So if we say add item, we say my first item still works. If we take out the parentheses and try it, nothing happens. So basically, when we say add item, it doesn't know what to do with that. Um, it's like add item is just the name of something. When we put in the parentheses, the parentheses are, are telling the browser, no, 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 I don't want you to just find the thing called add item. I want you to actually run the code inside of add item. That's what those parentheses are doing. Now we can leave out the event here because we don't actually end up using the event here. We name this thing called event, but then we don't use it in any of this code. However, event is one of those things that you don't realize you need it until you need it. And then you got to go back through and make sure you've got it in all the right places. So I end up putting the event in here just in case I need it. But because we didn't need it in that function, we can leave it out and it will work fine. So I, okay. I think I've been like tripping about something. So is the script.js just like um, the style CSS when we were doing? It is just like that. And so we can, we can prove that because in the browser, when we go to the console, we see hello world. If we go back to our HTML and just comment out the script tag so the browser ignores it, now, when we come in here and say hello and add the item, it says add item is not defined. Mm -hmm. Well, why isn't it defined? Because we didn't tell our index.html that the script tag existed. So now that when we put that in, it says, oh, now I know what add item is, but I'm not going to do anything in the add item because it's a function. I'm not going to do that add item until this on click happens. Then I'm going to go run that code. So it's kind of interesting. You can say your hello world and your um, end of JS file. And then in here, we already have our console log item added. So what we would think would happen is the computer would do this first, then it would do this item added, then it would do the end of the JS file. But that's not what's going to happen. Instead, we see hello world and end of JS file because this code is sitting in a function. That function isn't going to run until the JavaScript says, hey, you clicked on the button, go add the item. Now it goes back into the JavaScript and runs all of the code between the curly braces.
Um, what do you mean by the delete event, Shannon? I think she means when I asked about the event part, like, do you need it to be there? And you you said, like, you need the parentheses. You need the parentheses, but not the word event. You can leave it either way. Um, it, it won't make a difference in this project. But as we get more into JavaScript, we'll see that event uh, becoming more important and why we need to use it. Um, so it's fine to leave it either way on this code. Um, and then, um, yes, Shay, uh, console is almost exclusively used for debugging your code or seeing, um, where errors may be in your code, or if the code is outputting exactly what you wanted it to. Um, so console is very rarely used by an end user. Um, however, there are times that I have a more technical user and they'll call me and they'll say, your code isn't working, you know, it's broken somewhere. And I will actually ask them to open the console and screenshot it because oftentimes I'll see exactly what error message they're getting and then realize, oh, they forgot to type a, a name into this text box and that's why it's giving an error or something like that. So um, it is almost exclusively used for debugging or when we're writing code to test it to see if that's working. Um, if there are multiple buttons, you do not need to put um, a script tag every time. And I will show you a little example of that. If we wanted to, for some reason, put another button in here that says add on the left, we could use that same on click. And inside on this, say item one and click on my right button and then say item two and click on the left button. And that would work exactly the same. We can link multiple buttons to the same function or we could go into our script.js and say const um, another item or another button. And this time we could console.log button on the left clicked. And now take this another button and call it over here. And so now I say test and I hit add item and that shows up. If I say test and click out on the left, nothing happens, but we get button on the left clicked. clicked. So it's kind of like hitching up a trailer to a car. You can hitch the, that's a really bad example. I can say you could hitch two trailers to the same car or you could hit one trailer to two cars and that makes absolutely no sense but you can you can do uh, either I'm going to take this out just so it's not confusing but um, totally possible multiple functions in the same file totally fine okay so I'm I have a question too so I'm getting like the whole on click like we're gonna do this function add item or whatever yep. but what's, what's I don't know why I'm so confused by this but right there where you have highlighted like exactly after that like I'm not getting that little part with the I don't know why like I get that you have to put what you want that function to do inside the curly brackets but I'm having a really hard time with like this <laughs> like this yeah, little so, code here yeah so this is um let me do let me do another example. So let's say let's make a new function and we're going to call this function add. Well, add needs some information in order to know how to add. It needs to know what two numbers it's adding together. Num1 and num2. Okay. Now, how do we actually add those numbers together? We console.log out num1 plus num2. Okay, what's going on with these parentheses? 
these parentheses are what we call parameters. The parameters are the details that the, the computer needs to know in order to make that function work. Now, if I save this and come over here, nothing happens. Well, just like add item doesn't run until we hit the on click, this add doesn't run until we tell it what two numbers do we want to add together. So now this two and this three are going and getting sent up into num one and into num two. Now okay. we take these two things, add them together, and we see five comes out in our console. We're okay. doing that same syntax down here. We're saying const because it's a new, a new variable. Add item is the name of the function. Then we're doing the parentheses here to tell it it's a function. And we're telling it, hey, the details that you get access to are event. But we don't actually ever use that event. And then we use this arrow uh, syntax to tell it it's a function coming. And then the curly braces are, are what are saying what to, to run uh, every time that function is called. Corwin, an event does equal an action. The most common action is on click, but there is a on scroll, there is on window resize, there is on key press letter down, on key press letter up. Um, there is, Doug, I would argue that on load is a user action because they had to they had to open the page. Okay. I, I was thinking about that. Are, are, is every event tied to a user action? Um, so if you do a search for a JS event, MDN is great, but it sometimes gets a little too technical. So in my personal experience, I actually like W3 schools a little bit more. Um, and then there should be, they're going to show me up. Okay. Common HTML events on change, which is, uh, uh, like the input has been typed into on click, which we've already seen on mouse over and on mouse out. That's like saying, did the mouse get over this HTML element or did the mouse leave this HTML element on key down is literally every single letter press on the keyboard. Uh, and then on load is the browser is done loading the page, um, which could be important if you have like a bunch of different images on the page and you want something to show up only after the entire page has loaded. Um, and then W3 doesn't have the full list, but if you go to MDN, um, it will show you. Yeah, there are a lot of JavaScript events. Um, so how about a, a video event or audio event on complete? I mean, I guess the user typically will start it playing. So you could say it wouldn't complete without the user doing something, but it'll, yes. it'll complete on its own. Yeah. And so an event. Um, if you want to think about the event as being any user interaction, um, it's like, okay, the user just did something. Now as a historian, that's a new event. So what do we want to happen? And 99% of the time is nothing, right? The user scrolled down on the page. Oh God, what do we do? Nothing. We don't care about if the user scrolled down on the page. But you may say as a web developer, oh, I want the user to be able to see the first two paragraphs of the article. And then as soon as they start scrolling down to read more of it, we throw up that paywall, right? And we say, this is only available for our subscribers. That is when you could use that on scroll event to determine how far down the, the page they're scrolled and make that pop-up show up. Um, so there's a whole list in here. Um, yeah, I, I guess technically they aren't all user uh, based, but um, the Most. W3 schools list of these these five um, are definitely, or six are definitely the most common. Did I miss any questions in the chat or do we have any questions about this before we move forward? Ali, did I answer your question? Um, yeah, I believe so. Um, just for clarity, so are we only 
putting that event in like is that event just a placeholder for like is that particular or we do it is that? okay yeah so if we console log out the event we can actually see what's inside of it so it says pointer event and if we open that there are all of these different details in here this is actually where the mouse was positioned on the page coordinate wise when that button was clicked um we also get information about um what the pointer type was what if you were i don't know what other kinds of pointers you could have but um it's showing you if the device was tilted now we don't get any of that information on a laptop but you could actually tell on a i'm guessing theoretically on an iphone or a, a mobile device if the device was tilted a little bit when you clicked on that button um, you get details about the target and inside this target we can see that it was a button so let's say hypothetically you had nine different buttons on the page but you wanted to know which button was used um, to trigger this function you can use the event.target um, and so we could hypothetically do something like this say event.target dot inner html equals you have clicked on this button already so now when we say test and hit add item it turns to you've clicked on this button already okay well that's not really helpful because we could just use a document dot get element by id but hypothetically you could have another button that does the same exact thing well now when we say test and we click on this one it changes the text and if we do it over here now it changes that one so you can get into properties of hey this event happened that's great but I want to know more about it I want to know which event which what target was the event right which one did it happen on well that's when you can get into the details but because we don't need the event in this one we can leave this empty oh sorry are we just not specifying it because like the user input is subject to change so like if we were going to set a constant variable will we create like would the function be different if the user input was always going to be like the same thing um that it wouldn't be related to the event that would be related to this inputted text okay so we wouldn't need to go into the html to get out the value down okay. here instead of saying input box dot value um we could say um thing to add equals something and come down here and say thing to add and now we don't need any of this code up here, but we could say ABC and ABC, and now it's just adding something every every time. Okay, I think I'm just gonna, so I'll just like wait and see, cause I feel like I get it. I just feel like I'm overthinking it too much. So I'll just wait Probably. with future projects and see. Yep. And we're going to get practice with all of these concepts again. We're not done with on click. We're not done with um, with inner HTML or dot get element by ID. We're going to do more and more of that. Um, and yes, Brandy, the key click event is one one way to listen for keyboard shortcuts and make something run. Um, I would have to reference um, on key down JavaScript. Um, what you can do um is do the on key down so we could do inside of our input in addition to the on click on the button we can say on key down key press and give it access to the event. Then inside our JavaScript, we can say const key pressed equals a new function that gets the event. And we're going to console.log out the event dot 
target uh, event. Let's just log out the event and see what's in it. So I type uh, the letter A in here and it says, here's my keyboard event and look at all the detail that I get from it. I get if it, um, what the key code is, what the character code is, um, the number of it, the timestamp that it happened. I typed it in three seconds after the page loaded. Um, but I could even combine this with something like if event.key equals the word enter, then call add item. So now I come over here, I type in ABC, and everything that I'm typing in is not the word enter, so it doesn't matter. And as soon as I hit the enter key, it adds my ABC. Now this, this is a great example of pushing it a little further, saying, all right, I understand how the on click works. Let me try a new key event called on key down. Now we've got to make that function, but now we need an if statement for the first time, because every time a key is pressed, I don't want to add that item. I only want to add the item if the key that is getting pressed is enter. And if it is, go take my add item, which is up here. And then the parentheses are saying, go run it. Tara, go ahead. So to kind of recap, um, in this particular example that we were originally doing, we don't need the word event in there, but we should get used to adding the word event for future things that we might code. Correct. And this is a great example of it, right? Because in here, if we left out the word event, we come over here and type in test and hit enter. Okay, I don't know why that's working. In theory, if we were in here, it would be like, what's event? I don't know what event is. Well, event is actually getting passed in from uh, the browser, right? The HTML is telling it, hey, that event is the details of what the user just did. And that's why we put it here, just in case we need access to it. Like in this case, we need to know what key they pressed. All right, any other questions before we leave this? These are all great questions. Love seeing the understanding, love seeing you're pushing the barriers, making sure you're understanding it. Feeling good? All right, let's do it all over again. New project. Gonna go ahead and close out of this one. The live share link will change as well. So if you have live share open, you can go ahead and close that. Um, I'm going to head to my desktop, to my my code, to my week seven. I'm going to create a new folder called day two. I'm going to take my day two and I'm going to drag that into my VS code. I am going to start a new live share with you. I'm going to go into my files and I'm going to create a new one called index.html and the second one called script.js. I am going to put a console.log test in my, no, test in my script.js. I'm going to head to my index and do my exclamation point enter. And then down in my body, I'm going to do my script tag. Remember, script cannot be self-closing. We need the closing tag. And we are going to say src equals my script.js. Going to go ahead and save that. I'm going to go live. I see nothing in my HTML page, but I don't panic because I don't have any HTML in my body except for the script tag. So I go back over, I pop open my console. And whenever we're working on JavaScript, we should have our console open because we never know when an error is lurking in there that we don't know about. So I pop open the console, and if I see the word test, I know I have everything linked together and I am good to go. If you do not see the word test, let me know.
guys rolling in. Give me one more minute and then we will dive on in. Create two files, one index.html, the other one script.js. In the script.js, we're going to put our console log test. Make sure you've got your quotes around the word test. Then we go to our index.html, our exclamation point enter. We go down into the body and add in our script src. And we are good to go. Danny, you need help? Yeah, mine is showing when I, I tested it, it says test, and then under, under it says live reload enabled, and then it says failed to load resource. The server responded with a status of 404 not found. Does it say favicon in the 404? It has dot 5500-favicon dot ico.1 okay yeah that's normal um basically okay. what it's doing is like you see on w3 schools it's that like green w that's this little icon up here is called the favicon or the favicon i've heard it pronounced both ways um it was designed so that when you open your bookmarks that you see an icon on all of your favorites that you store into the browser. So that 404 is like, hey, I'm looking for that icon and I can't find it. That's not gonna impact any of your code. It's just saying heads up, I, I tried to load it and there wasn't one. So it showed this like little default eye up here. So that won't impact okay. any of your code. You can just ignore that. <laughs> yeah, I was just like, why do my user was like bug? He's like, I don't know either, so. <laughs> Sometimes a um, a Chrome extension will cause some weird error messages in your console that have nothing to do with your code. And you spend like four hours trying to figure out why you have an error message that no one else has. And it turns out it's like some Chrome extension just like crapped the bed or the server isn't working or there's some error message going on there. So um, that's, that's not a big deal. Um, okay, Jen, you so yeah, no problem. Jen, you should have the live reload message as long as you started it with the live server. Um, if you don't, it's probably not a big deal. All right, anyone need help? Yeah, I don't see test in my console, Matt. Um, okay, share your screen. All right. All right. Uh, um, so. so this is my code and um, when I look at my console, uh, I don't see anything. All right, go back to your HTML for me. Um, you've got a server script. Oh, I, I suppose, wow, okay, that's wow. I can't spell it though. That's why. All right. You good. No problem. All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Anyone else need help? Okay. So multiple approaches that we can take to a project, right? Um, obviously we all got to get our files set up. We got to do all of that, but developers take one of two approaches when they're working in a professional workplace. They either say, hey, I'm a full stack developer. I've got to build this project from start to finish anyway. I am going to build a, a little part of the interface. And as soon as the button shows up, I'm going to stop and go over to my JavaScript and go make that button work. And once that button's working, I'm gonna go back to my HTML and I'm gonna go build the next section of the page. And then when I get into another thing that needs to link to somewhere or run some JavaScript or do something, I'm gonna go back in and I'm gonna write that function. 
That's the way most of the time I work at work. I build a piece of the interface and then I move on. However, the other way of approaching this is saying, hey, I'm gonna do all of my HTML first. I'm gonna get all of my styling done. Once all of that is finished, now I can turn off the HTML part of my brain and go turn on the JavaScript part and make it all work. That's the approach we're gonna to take tonight. Um, because in our um, in the real world, oftentimes we work with designers. Now, I'm not saying that this is a pretty calculator by any means, but oftentimes as a developer, you're handed a PDF or you're handed some kind of design file and they go, here, I want, I want you to build this. I want the calculator to look like this. So that's the approach we're going to take tonight. We know what our end result needs to look like. So we're going all the way back to week two we are going to be building our, our HTML and our CSS until all of the HTML is done, or at least we think all of the HTML is done, and then we get to go make it work. So what we're gonna be doing over the next day and a half or so um, is making it so that you can click on a button and have that number show up, and you can click on another button and make it show up, and then you can use any of the operators along with another number. And when you hit the enter button, it does the calculation for you. So this is our second JavaScript project now. We had a little to-do list. We saw the beginnings of document object model. We saw a little bit of events and we saw all of that same syntax that we are already learning, right? The dot notation, the arrow function, the curly braces, all of that it's not from waste from week five, right? We're going to be applying all of that over the next couple of weeks. But for now, we're going to dive into, hey, this is the end result. This is what we want to make. Now, if you hate the styling of mine, I would say don't do it in class. But after class, you are always welcome to go back and style this however you would like. Um, if I remember correctly, Doug, you ended up making a very beautiful calculator from cohort three. Um, I don't know if you still have that link, but if you want to share that uh, during break, th that might be a good source of inspiration. Um, or I'm remembering completely correct in incorrectly, and you weren't the one who did that. But um, if you were- I made a calculator. <laughs> Feel, feel free to share that. Um, but we're going to dive in. We need actually one more file that I forgot about. I'm going to uh, add my style.css. And this is where the training wheels come off. I am not going to be using Bootstrap here. This is a basic enough interface that we do not need Bootstrap. However, what we do need is to go back to our index.html. I'm going to change my title to say calculator. And I'm going to add a link tag. And the link needs a rel style sheet. And it also needs an href to my style.css. Remember, when you're creating this file, the pound sign is not part of the file name. That's just the icon. So don't say pound style.css. Just put style.css. And that uh, should be good to go. So I'm going to go back into my HTML. And I build this from the top down. So I'm looking at this and I go, what's the first thing I notice? There is a big H1 tag there. That is, I'm going to need that uh, on my page. So I come in above my script. I say H1 calculator. I save. I come over here. I've got my calculator. I'm good to go. All right, now that I've got my calculator, I'm noticing that this is all one section of the screen, right? I'm going to want to be able to style that to be able to put a border around it. So I'm going to come down here and put in my div class container. Now I'm not, I don't have bootstrap in here. So everything that we know about a container or a container fluid goes out the door. None of that is going to get applied because we, di we didn't pull in bootstrap. 
So I can make my container do whatever it want, whatever I want. But before I get into the styling of all of that, I want to break it down. I want to get the basic information showing up. So what's the first thing that I notice about my container? Well, there's got to be like a screen. There's got to be something that's showing what numbers I've clicked on or what numbers I've typed in. So I'm going to, inside that container, put my div ID screen. Now, this is all theoretical because if I save all of this, all this code looks right ain't doing anything over here yet. Okay, that's because my screen should start out with the number zero. Whoops. Start out with the number zero in the div, not in the script tag. So I save that and all I get is this lonely little zero over here. Okay, so I've got my zero. I'll go back and style that in a second. I want to just get everything on the page first, and then we can identify what we want to style and, and change. So I've got the zero showing up. It's not in the right place. It's not styled right, but it's showing up. And now I'm like, all right, I'm moving down the page. So just like we think about rows moving down the page, we also want to think about the buttons, right? And we're saying, hey, this is a new row of buttons. In order to get a new row, all I need to do is make a new div. And inside that div, I've got five buttons, four buttons, one, two, three, and the plus. Okay, how do we handle that? Well, inside this div, I'm going to make a new button, and I'm going to say one. And I'm going to take that button, and I'm going to copy it three more times, say two, three, and plus. I see I've got my zero and my one, two, three plus. I'm going to stop there. Remind yourselves that while you're coding along here, this is not, dear God, I just need to get my code to look like Max's code. This is think about what you're typing, right? Think about, all right, I need a div for the container. Then what goes inside that container? Well, I've got a screen. Okay, what's next? There's a row of buttons. Why do I need to put a new div before I put all of those buttons in? Because we're progressing down the screen. So every time we put in a new div, we're, we're moving down horizontally the screen. Okay, now what goes inside of that div, all of the buttons that are going to go across. And this is what we're building up to. Give everyone just a breather moment there because the rest of this, believe it or not, a little copy and paste magic. This is what mine looks like right now. It's not pretty, but we can start to see a calculator forming. Looks like you guys are mostly good. Anyone need one more minute? Okay. I'm gonna wham bam a little bit with copy and paste. I'm gonna highlight this div and I'm gonna make sure that this closing div lines up with this opening div. So I'm starting not with the screen div, but with the div that's got all of my buttons on it or in it, I'm going down to that closing div. I'm going to copy that. Please, please, please make sure when, have, whenever you copy HTML code that if you're copying an opening tag, you're also closing, copying the closing tag, especially if there are multiple divs that you're copying. First most important thing is what you're copying. Second most important thing is where you're pasting it. So I'm gonna come down to the closing div that I just copied. I'm gonna hit enter. So my cursor is in the right place and I'm gonna hit paste. Then I'm going to hit enter again and paste. So I've got four sets of buttons.
and then stop there. Do not adjust any buttons. Go back over to your browser and make sure your browser looks like this. If it doesn't, if you've got buttons going across, if you've got them all in one row, if Prettier is angrier with you, you stop and you say, I just copied and pasted code. Now I'm going to go go pray and go fix those issues if there are any. Copy and paste, very powerful tool, but you want to make sure that you're not copying and pasting an error multiple times. Now we're going to finish this off and say four, five, six. The next one is minus. Then we're going to say seven, eight, nine. And this one is times. And then our bottom row is zero, a slash for divide, a equal sign, and a C for clear. We come back over and we've got some visual issues going on, but we've got all of our buttons in place. You've got this working, go on break, be back at 725. I will stick around for the next four minutes in case anyone has questions. Otherwise, enjoy your break and I'll see you at 725. Can we try to finish it if we can? Yeah. No, thank you. Yeah, if you got to finish, you can peace out of class early. Thank you. Max, I just wanted to ask a question. So yeah. I heard, so Doug did explain console log um, to me earlier, but I just wanted to hear like your, the way you. Um... Yeah. So think about it as um, you're driving your car, right? And there are noises coming from the engine and you know those noises aren't quite right, but you're not a mechanic and so you, you don't want to do anything. And so the, you pull your car into the shop and what's the mechanic do? He pops the hood. The console is like popping the hood, right? It's saying, all right, now I get to see what my JavaScript is doing behind the scenes. Because to a regular end user, they don't even know what JavaScript is. So the console is our way as we're building something to say, hey, I told you to go do this thing, but I want to be able to see your output without necessarily impacting what the, the regular end user is seeing. So we can tell our JavaScript, right? If we go into the JavaScript and we're like five plus nine, that's totally valid JavaScript. Now we come over here and we don't see 14 showing up anywhere. Why? Well, the computer added five plus nine together, but then it we told it not to do anything with it. Well, we could come in here and say console, uh, we could say const sum equals five plus nine. But if we save that, we still don't see anything. That the JavaScript's running, the browser is adding those numbers together, but until we tell it, hey, go to the console and log out our sum, that's when we see the 14 showing up. So it is a way to say, hey, we're going to write programs that are several hundred lines long. And sometimes it's not throwing an error, but it's still not doing what we want it to do. So the console is our place to be able to say, hey, go do this little snippet of code and make sure it's outputting what we expect. Because if it isn't, we know the problem is there and we don't need to go further. Or if it is, then we say, oh, the problem must be after this, let's go from there. So the, the best example of this is we just console logged the word test out because we could be in our index.html and misspell the word script or say, you know, misspell a file name here or any of that. And if we didn't have anything in our script.js, we would have no way of knowing that wasn't working. So then when we started building out our first feature, we could think that the problem was something with the on click or something with the add function or something wrong with our JavaScript, when in reality, it's an issue with just the way we have our script tag in here. So the point of the console is just to have a place that the mechanic 
can look under the hood, see what's going on without scaring the end user away of some technical information. Okay, and and one last question to that: Do we, um, like, when do we like? Because I've seen you have like the quotes around test, but then when you just did um, the other part, you didn't use them. So do, every time we do console log, do we use the quotations? Yeah. The quote has nothing to, to do with console.log. The quotes are about the data type. So uh, uh, quotes are a string. That is telling the computer, hey, we're not actually trying to tell you to run a command here. This is just some text that we want you to keep track of. Stella, over here. Sorry about the barking. So if we did a console.log and said five plus nine, we get the output of that, no quotes. If we said the sum is equal to five and console log the sum, we get five. Okay. What if we wanted the word sum to show up in our console? That's when we would use the quotes. We would say console.log sum is, and now it's going to say sum is five. Okay. If we take those quotes out, it's like, what the heck is is colon? That's not JavaScript syntax. That's not a variable. I don't know what's going on there. So the reason why the quotes are important is we're saying, no, 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 we don't want you to use the value of some. We're not giving you a variable here. We want you to take this string of letters, which is why it's called a string, and just output that group of letters together. Okay. That help? Right. Thank you. No problem. All right. So we got all of our HTML done. We think we are all finished with this. So now we get to move on to our basic styling. So what we are going to do is take a look at my uh, final version, right? The, the mock-up that I'm trying to recreate. And I'm going to head over to my style.css. And the first thing I notice is that container. This container is kind of holding everything together. That's what I want to start with. So what I am going to do is target my container and my container has the class on it. So I come over here and I say, hey, get my container. And inside my container, the first thing I notice is this green border going on. So let's add that. Let's say border. And that looks like it's a little bit uh, more solid than normal. So let's say 3px or a little thicker, I mean, green. And I'm going to save that. And I get my border showing up, but it's a little too wide, right? So I'm going to say, let's play with some numbers there. Let's say the width is 200 pixels. And that isn't quite right. I could keep playing with this until I hit the lottery. Or I can click on my little icon here, get that container selected. And then over on the right part of my screen, click in the width field and hold in shift and use the down arrow. And that is going to shrink down the width until I get it to where I want it to be. So I'm going to say, all right, 110 looks just about right. So I'm going to go back into my code and I'm going to change this to 110. So that's a good start. I come back over here and I go, all right, my screen has some styling going on with it. So I go back to my index.html and I see that I already have um, a um, ID for the screen. So I am going to target that. Asma, what's up? Can you repeat how you did that on um, the web browser for the yeah, web? Absolutely. Um, right click, inspect, head to the elements tab, then click on this little icon, the very most left icon. 
that's going to let you select a, a portion of the screen in your inspect. I get the mouse kind of just at the right spot to make sure that I have the entire element selected. It may also be easier to go into your elements and just click on the div class container. You might need to expand uh, certain elements to be able to get to that. But once you have your container selected, you single click on the width number, and then you hold in the shift key and then arrow up to make it bigger by 10 or arrow down to make it smaller. Goggin, what's up? So I did on the container, uh, I did width fit content. Um, That's probably fine. We're going to do some styling on the, the border or on the buttons um, to get the spacing right. But fit content uh, is probably fine. All right, perfect. I just wanted to know. <laughs> OK, so I'm going to go uh, target my screen. And inside my screen, I've got a background of green in there. And if you don't want to use green, you don't have to use green. You can use whatever color you want. Um, so I'm going to say green. And now that shows up. But I notice my number zero is hard to read. So let's change that color to white. And then I also notice that my number is over on the right part of the screen, right? When we think about a calculator, it's usually on the right part. So I'm going to text align that right. That moves my zero over. Um, I also notice there's a little bit more breathing room. That zero feels really tight on that screen. So let's go ahead and add in some padding around the whole thing of 10 pixels. So that's feeling a little bit better. Um, now I can, the last thing I notice is when I type in numbers here, it's not in Times New Roman. It's in a kind of a monospace font. So in order to fix that, I'm going to say font family. And I'm actually going to use the autocomplete here because you notice what's up on my screen. It says courier new courier monospace. This is basically a fail safe system. So if it has courier new installed on the computer, it will use it. If it can't find courier new, it will use the courier, courier font. And if it can't find courier, it will use some generic monospace font that the computer has installed. Um, so that the reason why we have the three commas there is to basically say, just in case the computer doesn't have that, that font, um, go ahead and use another one. So I come over, I look at this, and I'm like, all right, my screen's looking right. Those buttons are really cramped, though. So I'm just going to say, you know what? I noticed that there's some breathing area beneath that screen. We can fix that with a little bit of margin. So I am going to say, hey, the margin on the bottom of this is 15 pixels. Push those buttons away from the screen. We use padding inside the border and margin outside the border. Give you guys a minute to catch up on that, and then we will dive into the button styling. Max, can I ask a question about um, the margin bottom? Yeah. So, like, let's say, like, um, I just want to say this about my capstone real quick. So, my, um, I noticed that my logo is a little lower on the left than like the, like my links, my nav bar. So, could I use margin bottom to bring that up, or? No, but you could use. It, it depends. Um, so if you have it in a column, you wouldn't want to make sure that it's set to be fluid so that the image isn't spilling over the column size. Um, and in those scenarios, that's when you get into um, really needing flex to be able to say like, hey, I want my image to show up and be this height, but then I want all of the links to be centered based off of how big that image is that's when flex comes comes into play. Um, there are times that you can use negative margin and negative padding, um, but it really gets a little dicey in your code. Um, so if it works for you, great. You can always try it, but flex is probably going to be the right solution for what you're looking for there. Thank you. 
add a smile on top. My green area is not going all the way down. You see how it fits your uh, the numbers? Mine is like literally stuck on the first numbers, one, two, three, plus. Okay, check your closing div tags uh, in your HTML. You should have your div ID screen. Make sure you've got your closing div for the screen before you start a new div for your buttons. Do you have Do you have that? Yeah. All right, share your screen. Okay, share. Yep, you're good. Um, okay, so the problem that you have is you've got your opening div and your closing div for the screen. You've got your opening div and your closing div for your first row of buttons, but then you've got a closing div here for your container. Oh, okay. And so save that. And if prettier becomes mad at you, then you are probably missing a closing div tag at the end before your script tag. Okay, I don't have prettier on this computer. I'm using a different one. Okay. Um, but it's, it's still showing the same thing. Okay, so scroll down to your script tag um, and you are missing a closing div before that script tag for the container. Where is the script tag? This one right here? Yep. So closing, I have a closing one over here though. That's for the row of buttons. You need a closing div for the container itself. Okay. Uh, be careful, it auto-completed for you. And now save and see if that fixes it. Okay, all set. Good. Thank you. No problem. Anyone else need help? Shay, what's up? Yeah, so I think there's something wrong with my code because the uh the CSS ain't popping up. Actually, let me show you. Uh, I mean. just scroll up to the top for me right, of your index.html. I can't even see. Uh, let me see your styro.css. I don't see anything wrong there. Um, ah, thank you, Taylor. Go back to your index.html. You've got a uh, ref. It should be rel in your line eight. Oh, okay. That's what I was thinking. Did that fix it? Yeah, that's that's what we're. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. You beat me to it. Anyone else need help? Okay. So we're gonna finish up our styling, and then we are done with our HTML and our CSS, and get back into our JavaScript. So I've got my buttons. <clears throat> really nicely aligned here. But before we fix them, I wanna talk about why they're not working quite right. And I have to give you a little bit of a font lesson here. So you notice in our text, how items always align here. This is what we call a monospace font. When we say monospace, every letter takes up the same amount of space. Well, what do we mean by that? If you look, this minus sign is actually a little less wide than something like the equal sign. The same goes for this slash. The slash doesn't take up quite as much space as the other numbers do. So if we zoom, not on that, if we zoom way in here, we can actually see this slash isn't lining up with the eight. All of these numbers roughly take up the same amount of space, but because the slash doesn't take up the same amount of space, everything isn't aligned together. And that's causing some issues. So what we can do to fix that is we can go target our buttons in our style. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to say, regardless of what symbol is in the button, the width of that button should be 20 pixels. Okay. That fixed the problem. Everything's now aligned, but that looks a little funky. It looks like some of these numbers aren't centered in the button. That's because there literally just isn't quite enough space for those buttons. So I'm going to set my width to 30 pixels. Woo. That's not good. What happened to my divs? Well, it's not actually the divs that broke. It's that this div this um, div does not have enough width to contain all of the buttons inside of it. So HTML doesn't break the width rule. What it does is it just pushes everything down onto the next row. So to fix that, we're going to go up to our container and let's put a width of it on 200 pixels. That looks a little big right now, but let's just leave it there because I also noticed that I'm missing some space between my buttons. And so I want to clean up that a little bit and then we can come back and play with this width and see where we're at. So I come down to my buttons and I go, all right, I want uh, a little padding inside those buttons. I'm going to say five pixels. So those buttons have a little bit of breathing room. Now I'm going to say, you know what? I don't like that this button is right up against that side. So I'm going to add a little margin on the left. And I don't need a lot of it. I think I'm just going to use three pixels and see what that looks like. All right. If we do three pixels on the left, we should probably do three pixels on the right. And that's feeling a little bit better. Um, I don't like this gray background, right? I kind of like that this has, it really feels like a, like a actual physical button. So I'm going to come in here and nuke that. I'm going to say background none instead of specifying a color. And I don't love that there aren't gaps between the buttons, right? All the buttons are on top of each other. So let's throw some margin on the bottom of 10 px. Okay, feeling pretty good about all of that. I come back over here and I go, all right, I've got too much width. I'm going to use my trick again. I'm going to go to the width and bump that down. 160 looks like the perfect width. So I'm going to come over here. And remember, I'm not usually a fan of using width. I don't like using width because of mobile responsiveness. What happens if a user... Uh, loads this on a bigger screen, right? What if those elements start wrapping around? We don't want to design for what looks good on our monitor, and then we go load it on our, on our external monitor, and because the width is set, we get weird things wrapping. However, because we're controlling the width of every individual item inside this container, no matter how big of a screen they're on or how small of a screen they're on, that width is always going to be the same. There's no phone screen that someone's going to load this on that's going to have a width of less than 160 pixels. So in this case, I'm okay to use width. But I caution you guys in your capstone, use it very sparingly um, because you get weird stuff with responsiveness and you'll design your whole site and it will look perfect. And someone will load it on a phone screen and it will look like vomit. It will look like the CSS didn't load, it will look terrible. So um, with in, um, within your CSS, you can use just make sure that you're uh, using it intelligently and making sure that you are um, checking on multiple different screen sizes before you set your width. Um, Asma, I see that you're a uh, asking about comments. There's another shortcut for comments. Um, no matter what file you're in, whether it's uh, JavaScript index or your CSS, if you hit command slash, it will automatically insert the opening and closing comment for you. And then you can type your comment in here. The same goes if you highlight multiple lines of code and hit command slash, it will also put those comments in for you. So command slash, really helpful, um, really helpful uh, keyboard shortcut to comment either existing code or if you're on a blank line, you can hit it and it will put that in for you and position your cursor at the right spot. Okay, does anyone have HTML or CSS nightmares? Anyone need code cleanup? Anyone not have their calculator looking like this? 
Um, the padding on the left of the numbers and the border. I don't have any on mine. Um, if you wanted to, you could text align the entire page, um, which should in theory center everything. Let's see, if I do a margin zero auto on that, that moves my calculator to the center of the page. Um, so if you uh, like that look, we can also say we could move our H1 calculator into the container. You, no, don't do that. We can go down to the body and text align center. And that centers everything, if you like that look. Um, and then padding on the left of the numbers and the border. Uh, what do you mean by the border? Like, so mine, uh, it seems like my, uh, like my number, like one through zero is a little closer than the symbols on the left. Um, like they're not centered. I could show you. Um, sure. Uh, I have a, um, margin bottom 10 PX on my buttons. Uh, so like right here, I feel like my a little more space than on this side. I want to leave it more. Let me see Even. your CSS for your button. Um, you got margin left twice. Oh, wow. Yes, Every pixel matters, especially when we're applying it to so many of them, because it's not just three on either side, it's three for each button. Okay. Anyone else need help? Noting. You want mustard? No. Just... Everyone good? Anyone need help? OK. Let's crack on to our CSS. So we have a very simple task to start with. I'm here, and I say, when I click on the number Can one, I want again? Sorry, can oh, you share your screen yes, again? Thank you. When I click on number one, I want the number one to show up here. That may seem like a really simple statement. It's really important that when we're working on tasks, we don't, we're able to articulate that because you can be like, well, yeah, of course that's what we want. But that's going to take multiple lines of code to break that down to understand that, right? So when we're saying, well, when we click on the button number one, we want the number one to show up in the screen. That's one sentence, way too much to try and accomplish all at once. The first thing that we're actually trying to do is saying on click of this button, connect to your JavaScript. That's all we're going to try and do. And even that's multiple lines of code. So what we're going to do is we're going to come over here and we are going to say, hey, on click, what do we want to do? We are going to say a button has been clicked. And we've already established that adding in the event is really good practice. OK. But that's not doing anything in our JavaScript yet. So I'm going to move my JavaScript to the lower half of the screen. Make sure that you're in your actual JavaScript, not in your CSS. Don't want to accidentally mix files here. We're done with our CSS. You can close out of it. I'm in my script.js. And now I need to create this thing that's going to run when the button is clicked. So I'm going to say const button clicked. It's going to get the event as a parameter. And all we're going to do is console.log out button clicked. So I save that. I come back over here. I click on my one button. And it looks like nothing is happening. But if we go to our console, we can see our button is clicked. And that's what really matters.
Do you guys think the real reason we got you two monitors was to make it easier for you to learn and have all this up on your screen? It's really just so I can see your heads moving back and forth between the two of them so I know if you're done or not. So again, make sure you're in your console. You won't know if this is working unless you have your console open. And this button clicked will not show up until you click on number one. Then you should see your button clicked down here. Only the button one will work. Why is that? Because we only added the on click to button clicked. Okay, now that we added button clicked, you see that I've got some a capital C. I mirror that in my function name. If this does not line up with this, the HTML is not going to line up down here. Um, Kenny, we're not going to approach that question. We're going to reuse the button clicked function across all of the buttons. Um, but if you want to stick around after class tomorrow, I can show you a way to what we call refactor the code. Um, to apply that function to all of the buttons without having to do it manually. Okay. Anyone need help? Anyone not get their button clicked in the console? How we stop and go, all right, do we understand every single letter that I just typed in? This is not just about following along. This is about, do I have understanding about linking the event through my HTML to a new function in JavaScript? Jen, what's up? I am not getting a button clicked. Share the screen. Um, button clicked, button clicked. Um, refresh your page in the browser and then click on the button one. There oh, I was pushing other buttons. <laughs> yep, we only have our on click on button one, which is the only reason why that's working. Thanks. Okay, so now we've got our button clicked. And we're like, all right, what do we want to do now? We want to make it so this zero changes to whatever number was clicked. Well, we can go get the screen and go change all of that. But how do I know what button was clicked? I want to write this function in some way that I can know which button was clicked without having to write a separate function for every single individual button. This is when we need our event because the event has information about the target that the event was performed on. So if I do a console.log event.target, I come over here, click on one, and now I see button click, on click, button click the event, one button. All right. That one is what I want to get into. Where is that one? That is inside the inner HTML of my button. So if I just do an inner HTML and save, when I come over here and click on one, I get just the number one in my console. Okay, that's great, but we should be able to test that with something else, right? So let's go take our on click and copy and paste it onto our other two number buttons. Now I come over here, I click on three and I get three in the console. And if I click on one, I get one in the console. Again, I took my on click, make sure you've got your opening and closing quotes with that. I copy that and I put that on the other two number buttons. And then in my JavaScript, we're using the event. And the event happened on some button. 
So that is the target of the event. And then just like we use inner HTML to get the, to put new content into our page, we can also use in, inner HTML to get out the number that is inside that button. So this is not working on any other buttons other than one, two, or three. But if you click on one, two, or three, you should see what number you clicked on in the console. And Sequoia, to your point, why do we even need this console log? Well, we need to make sure that we're, that number is coming back before we do all the screen work and all of that. We could just try and write it all out. And if it works, great. But if it doesn't, we're not going to know where it breaks. So we're actually going to delete this console log in a second because we, we don't need that information, but we just want to make sure that that little snippet of code is working before we move on. All right. Now we know what number was clicked on. Let's actually save that in a variable. Let's say a uh, button, uh, let's say uh, number clicked equals my event target in our HTML. Okay, now we've got our number stored in a variable. Now we need to target, to do something with that. Well, what do we want to do with it? We want to put it in the screen. But before we can put it in the screen, we have to get access to the screen itself. So we're going to say, hey, the screen is equal to document, go into our HTML, get the element. The ID of the element is going to be screen. And once we have that screen, we are going to set the inner HTML of that screen to the number clicked. So I come over here and I click on my number one. Number one shows up in the screen. I click on my number two. Mm, two shows up. But if I think about how a calculator works, if I type in one, two on the calculator, it should show me the number 12. It shouldn't replace whatever is in the screen. We've already run into this problem before. How do we fix that? Concatenation. Concatenation. You can say, hey, take whatever is already in the screen and add on to it whatever number was clicked. So I save that. I come over here. I click one and I get zero one. And I'm like, damn it, I don't want that. But we go, all right, hold on. What if I click two and three? That's working now. So we got a different error. Before we solve that problem, pat yourself on the back because we fixed the problem and caused another problem, but that's progress. Sometimes it's one step forward, two steps back to get three steps forward. Jen, where are you frustrated? Just solving a problem and making another one. <laughs> that happens. I remember, didn't we have to put the um, empty quotations in order to clear it out? We did, and that's actually an approach that we could take, but we don't want it to clear it out every time we want to type a number. We only want to clear it out if the only number there is zero. How would we go about doing that? If statement. If statement. We want to say if the screen inner HTML is equal to zero. Now, if you are wrapping your head around JavaScript, you just saw me type a zero and put it in quotes and your brain should be screaming bloody murder right now of wait, 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 it's a number. Why is it in quotes? Because whenever we get a value out from our HTML, It looks like a number here, but look at what happens if I type in type 
of screen.html. That is a new JavaScript keyword for you. When I click on that number, it tells me it's a string. Why is it a string? Because according to HTML, every single thing in HTML is a string. There is no such thing as a data type in HTML. So that when we pull that information from the HTML through the document object model, JavaScript doesn't know if it's a number, if it's a string, if it's a Boolean. According to HTML, everything is a string. And so what we have to do is keep in mind that whenever we use inner HTML, whenever we retrieve a value from our HTML, no matter what kind of data type it is, it will always be a string. So we're going to say screen.innerHTML if it equals zero. If zero is the only thing in the screen, what do we want to do? We want to overwrite whatever is in that screen HTML with whatever number got clicked. So I save and I come over and I click one and I get 11. What the heck? And I click two and that works and I click three and that works. That's weird. Let me refresh the screen, takes me back to zero. And I click two and I get two, two. Like, um, and I click three. So now we start getting into testing, right? We're testing our code. And the issue on first glance looks like whenever we click the button, it puts in the number twice. But if we click on these other buttons, it only puts in the number once. And if we click on two again, it's only in there once. So this is where it's really important as a tester to not only say, when I click on the button, I get the number twice. It's important to identify that I only get the number twice if it's the first button that I click on. All right, well, what's going on there? I use the keyword if, so it has something to do with this. What's the computer doing? It's getting whatever the number was clicked out from the event. It's getting the screen so we can update it. It's checking to see if the screen is equal to zero. And if it is, overwrite what's ever on the screen. But because this is not part of the if statement, it is always going to run that. So what we need to do is say, if the screen is equal to zero, then put in the number clicked. Otherwise, else, if the screen is not equal to zero, mm -hmm. then take whatever's in the screen and add the new number onto the end of it. So now I save, I come over, I click one, and my zero is gone. I refresh and I test multiple scenarios. I click on a three, that works. I click on two, that works. And now I type, I click on either one, two, or three, and I get that added to my screen. If you got it working, pause, take a breather, read through that code. Can you tell me why we need the if statement? Can you, in English, tell me what lines 7 through 11 are doing? Are you asking us? Rhetorically, but also... So, like, if it's, like, set to zero, your inner HTML, like, as soon as you click something, the inner HTML... Is going to like retrieve the number that you clicked and place it in there? Yep. All but right. you want to break that down line by line because that's what the whole function is doing. But if you yeah. said that as a paragraph to yourself at the beginning of class, would you know how to do that? Probably not, not right? So break it down even further. Leave yourself some notes here and say, okay, the leave yourself a note like, this only runs when a button is on click from HTML. Then come in here and say, get the inner 
HTML, the number um, from the event, um, i.e. which button, which number was clicked on. Okay, once we get that, we also get the screen from the HTML so we can change the content of it. Then we say, if the number in the screen is zero, then put the new number clicked in, uh, on top of it. Else, the number in the screen is not zero. So add on whatever number was clicked to the end of the existing numbers. That's how I understand it. The computer understands it as screen.innerHTML equals number clicked. The computer says if, okay, screen, go get that object. Inner HTML, that's a property of it. Triple equals, okay, I'm checking for equality. Uh, quotes, that's a string. Okay, the number zero. Does the number zero equal screen.innerHTML? You guys don't need to understand it on that level. You don't need to understand, you don't need to explain it on that level. What you need to be able to do is say, hey, between lines 11 and 18, what we're telling the computer is if the screen is equal to zero, then overwrite it with the new number clicked. Otherwise, take the new number that's clicked and add it on to what's already part of the screen. And in either situation, update the screen with that new value. If you could explain the code that way, now you can work in reverse, right? You can break that down. That's a paragraph. You can break it down into sentences to identify where your code is, what your code needs to be. Okay, if, what's an if statement? Why do we need an if statement? Because we want it to run if this is true and if it's not true, we want this other thing to happen. Take a minute, is it sinking in? All right. And move on here to some other magic. We've got this working on one, two, and three. We are also going to take this on click and apply it to every single. Actually, we're not. I'm going to answer Kenny's question because I think it's a very good question and we're practicing JavaScript questions. So might as well get a new concept in. Okay. So this on click, we're applying to every single button here. And we actually want it to apply to every single button. And I'm like, well, it seems very repetitive to put this on every single button. That breaks a concept that we call dry. Don't repeat yourself, D-R-Y. And in code, we always want to try and be as efficient as we can. Unfortunately, HTML doesn't really make it easy to make a component that we can use over and over again. We'll get to uh, how we can solve that in our React code when we start learning React in week 14, 13, week 13. But we can solve this problem of, hey, I want this on click to apply to every single button that I have. Well, in order to do that, we can actually get all of the buttons. So what we're going to say is all buttons equals we got to go to our document like we always do. And then we are going to get elements by tag name. And the tag name that we're going to use is button. 
Now I'm writing this code on the fly. Don't have this pre-written. I don't know if that's going to work. So I am going to console log out all my buttons. I come back over here and I've got button, 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 HTML collection 16. Okay. We're on a good sign because I've got a grid of four buttons across and four buttons down. So those are all 16 of my buttons. If I didn't get 16 buttons here, I know something's wrong and I need to go figure out why my get elements by tag name didn't work. Maybe I said get element by tag name by mistake and I didn't get all 16 or I got some error message there. Maybe I named the variable wrong. We use const because it's a new variable. We try this out. We've got all of our buttons. Computers are terrible at dealing with lists of items. What do we use in order to deal with each item in that list? Indexes. Indexes, and we use indexes in a Array. for loop. You got it, Kenny. No. So what we're going to do is we're going to say for const button of all buttons. All we're doing there is saying loop through each individual button and do something with it. So what I'm going to do to test this is console log out my button dot inner HTML. And I'm going to save that because I just want to see, I want to make sure my for loop is running. I could have done the syntax wrong. I could have said for const buttons of all button and missed an S or put the S in the wrong place. That could have happened. But I just want to make sure that my button is working. My for loop is working. So I come over to my console. Look at all of the stuff that just came out here. What's happening here? It found one, two, three, and plus, and every time it found a button, it output the content of that button. And now I get 16 different things logging out for each of my buttons. Okay, pretty cool. Hopefully there's a little flicker of a light bulb for someone of why we need a for loop. Hopefully not as traumatizing as the first time we covered them. So we're here and I'm like, all right, but I don't really care about each one of the buttons in our HTML. What I want to do is take the button and say, when the button is on clicked, go run my button clicked. And this is the scariest moment as a teacher because I've never tested this code before and I usually have some code to reference. If I come over here and click on a button, seven shows up. If I click on another button, eight shows up. All right, well, what's going on with our seven and our eight? We don't have any on click on that. No, we use our JavaScript to reach into our HTML to tie it back into our JavaScript. We just made it. So now no matter what button we put on the screen, it will take our button clicked function all the way from up here and tie it in to that button's on click function. That's pretty cool. Yes, Jen. And that is going to be my next step. Now that we've got the code dynamically adding on that on click to any button, we can take that on click off here. And that's what we call refactoring our code. Yeah, we could get this done by copying and pasting it much easier. But now that we have these three lines of code, these three lines of code are getting applied to any button that we put on the screen. So we go back and we take out the code that we don't need. Ali, I'm glad that things are, are more a uh, little easier to understand. Danny, what's up? When I, my, my, my button on click, the word on click is in yellow. And I don't understand why. Is it I working? 
if it's Thank working, you. I wouldn't worry too much about the color, but you can share a screen. So okay. it's the button clicked word. Um, my on click and button clicked are yellow. It is just the screen share that does not have them as yellow. So okay. or, I'm sorry, it's the live share that doesn't have them as yellow. So when I restart my my screen share, you'll see that mine are actually yellow. It's something with the live share with the, the color syntax highlighting doesn't doesn't come through. OK, so it was working. I just didn't understand why mine was not showing up the right color. Mine is not. Thank you. Talking, what's up? It's not. I don't know why it's not working. Everything looks fine. Share screen. Let's take a look. Okay, one second. I checked it three times. Let's see. Looking good. I like your styling. You've got a capital C on your on click instead of a lowercase. Mm -hmm. In line nineteen. Okay. Yeah. So I had a question about that too. So it's supposed to be lowercase. Yes. All events in JavaScript are lowercase. Do not ask me why, because JavaScript uses camel case for everything else. Um, but events for whatever reason are all lowercase. What the hell? That's confusing. I, I think it's one of those things that they regretted it, but once they committed to it, they can't change it. And now 30 years later, that's what they're locked into. Okay, I thought it was just me. I thought I was bugging. I'm like, why is that the only thing not in camel case? Why can't they? change it though because they would have to like make a whole new language around that no because every website that is now using a lowercase c instead of a capital c would stop working you really want to see my mass chaos make javascript not work on you know 30 years of websites that have already been built um it is a huge legacy and a huge problem um and in fact, Python made some changes to their syntax between version two and three. And because of that, now when you run Python code, you have to specify whether you're running version two Python or version three Python, because the syntax in one of them uh, will break, like the Python three syntax will break Python two syntax. Um, and there's still wide debate in the community of whether they made the right decision there in making that change. Um, but yes, for JavaScript, you have to be very, very careful about um, breaking changes to previous things. Okay, wait, so I'm like writing this in my note. So it's only for events, which are only the, um, like when the you're writing on a function. whatever, on key press, on click, on uh, mouse over, all of those oh. are lower. Okay, thank you. And just to confuse you, as soon as we get into React, they're all upper. They're all camel case. They go back to the way they should be. Yeah, the crazy thing to think about, JavaScript was invented in two weeks. The guy who wrote JavaScript spent two weeks because Netscape needed to ship a solution to this problem. Um, and his name's Michael, Earl. is it Ehrlich? Um, yeah, one guy sat in his basement for two weeks and created JavaScript uh, in its entirety, and it's now used around the world 30, 27 years later That's in good. every single browser. He must have been on a limitless pill or something. On drugs. <laughs> yeah. yeah he's on mushrooms on that. He got it. Came out in 1995, uh, Brendan Ike, E-I-C-H. Um, I, I'm not sure if that's like an old wives tale of or or some story to immortalize them. Um, but I have heard that yeah, he built he built the whole thing in um in two weeks. Okay. Let's try and get over the finish line here with getting something working. So I'm going to come back over here and I say two plus yeah. two. Clearly, I am not on the limitless pill. OK, so I do two plus two. And I'm like, all right, all of that's cool. Now I want to get four. So I come down here and I hit 
equal. And I got an equal sign. Like, no, 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 I, I don't want you to, I want you to do something different. I want you to actually evaluate what is in that screen and make it work. So I'm going to come down to my JavaScript and I am going to say, if, uh, let me think about how I want to do this. I want something That'd else. That'd be an set. array, like a let. Not an array. We're going to do another if statement. I want this button clicked to run only if it's an if it's something other than the equal button. So I'm going to say const. Uh, let's do it up here. Const equal pressed is going to equal some function that's going to get the event. And the event is just going to console log equal pressed. So I come over here, I do my two plus two. I hit equal and the exact same thing happens. Well, the computer magically doesn't know to use this equal pressed thing. We need to give it the logic in our for loop to attach that on click to something else. So we come in here and I say, if the button inner HTML is equal to equal in a quote, it's kind of confusing. The triple equal is saying, hey, does the thing on the left equal the thing on the right? The thing on the right, I'm actually looking at that equal sign inside the button. So I'm going to say, if the button's inner HTML equals the equal button, then button.onClick equals our equal pressed function up here. Else, I want you to go run the button clicked function that works for everything else. So I added up my const equal pressed. I made sure that was above my for loop because if it's not above my for loop, it doesn't know what equal pressed is until I get done the loop. So it has to go above it so that it knows what it's looking for. And now I modified my if statement down here to say if the button's inner HTML is a single equal, if the if we're on the equal button, then go use the equal pressed function. Otherwise, it's some other button, go do the button clicked instead. So I come over here, I click on two numbers, I click the equal sign, and nothing happens. But that's a really good thing. Nothing happening means it now is not running the button clicked, which is going to put that equal up on the screen. But also look at what's going on in my console. It recognized that the button was clicked three times. And after that, the equal was pressed. Now our equal pressed function is routing properly. Okay, so I have a quick question. Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> just for clarity, so like if I was gonna read um like the function in its entirety backwards, would I say um so uh 
I want all this stuff to happen for well, damn. I, I had it in my mind and now I can't think of it. Now I'm confused. So be careful that that for loop isn't a function. The only oh. two functions we have are the equal pressed and the button clicked. So this for loop isn't in a function. It's in the JavaScript. It's in the script that we're writing. And this, because it's using the curly braces, we call that a block of code, mm -hmm. but it isn't a function. Okay. With that said, if you want to try and talk through the for loop, you can. Or, you, or I can do it for you if you want me to do it. So I had it, so I want this chunk of code like performed when this thing is like, when these things are called upon basically. Yeah, so the way I, I say it is go get all of the buttons from the HTML and store them in this thing called all buttons. Then go through each one of all of the buttons and give me access to each individual button. And every time that I get each individual button, I want to look at the HTML inside of the button and see if it's equal to the equal sign. And if it is, I want to say when that button is clicked on, the same button that we're looping over each individual time, I want to say when that button is clicked on, go run the equal pressed. But if the inside of that button is not equal to the equal sign, then instead I want you to take that button, still attach an on click, but use the button click function instead of the equal pressed. Okay, so I think <clears throat> I think where my confusion is, so in between the parentheses after the four, is that doing two separate things yes it's saying this is running 16 times okay why is it running 16 times because there are 16 buttons in all buttons and the point of this for loop is to give us access to this button first then this button then this button so to to prove that that's happening we can do something like console log equal pressed attached to button, and then we can say button dot inner HTML. And we can say that same thing, console dot log button clicked attached to button and say button dot inner HTML. Now, when we look at our console, we see button clicked attached to button one, button clicked attached to button two, button clicked attached to button three, all the way down until we get to our equal here. Then all of a sudden we get our equal attached to button equal button. What we're doing is getting all 16 of the buttons and then individually going through each single one of them and getting access to them in the button here. Now, as we're going through all 16 of them, we're looking at that first button and saying, is that equal to the equal button? If it is, put equal pressed on it. If it's not, put the button clicked on it. Great, what's the next button? That's button number two. Does button two in our HTML equal equal? No, it doesn't. So go to the else, put the button clicked on it. All right, go to the three, go to the plus, button clicked, button clicked, button clicked. All of a sudden, it gets to the second to last button, the 15th button, and it goes, oh, whoa, hold up. This button's inner HTML is equal to the equal sign. So instead of putting button clicked on it, put equal pressed on there instead. So this console log doesn't affect anything, but it does show us, hey, this for loop, what order is it running through everything? What's it attaching it to? That's when we can use our console log to debug to understand it. I'm going to comment that out, comment this out. 
So our console isn't filled up, but if that's helpful for you, you could leave that in. Yeah, no, that that helped a whole lot, actually. Like, <laughs> okay, like I'm I'm really, I had like a little light ball moment. Nice. So we are going to stop here for the night. We are so close to making that equal button work, but we've got some other concepts that we want to touch on here with the clear button and a couple other things working. And then tomorrow we dive back into the weather app all the way back to what week two or week three when we built that weather app we're going to start layering in some javascript and that's when you're going to start having some light bulb moments of oh when a user does this thing in the browser on my capstone i can make something else happen or i can go update that data we're going to learn a little bit more about our data structures our objects our arrays we're going to practice with all of that and then we push weather back aside and when we come back to weather the next time, we actually make it work with an API. We actually pull in live weather data and make the forecast show up and all of that kinds of information. Um, yeah, Ali, you shouldn't be touching your HTML um, as long as your HTML is displaying it the way you want it to. Yeah, everything that we'll be interacting with will be in our JavaScript, but oftentimes you'll find um, that you have to modify your HTML with IDs, with classes, or you may get data back and be like, oh, I didn't think about the high and low temperature. I just thought about the current temperature. So I need to go modify my HTML to display both of those pieces of information. So it's not like you're banned from touching your HTML, um, but it, it just depends on what, what you're looking to accomplish there. Um, Asma, no, we're not doing an API on Thursday. We are diving into the weather app again to make it interactive, to make it so that when you change a dropdown, it updates all the information on the page, but it's still dummy weather data information. Um, when we come back to the weather project on week 13-ish, somewhere around there, that's when we start bringing in the API. So weather and the chat application are two things that you are just going to wish will die because we keep on coming back to them. We keep on adding to them. Um, and that, that kind of all builds on each other. And yes, Capstone is definitely done in steps. Rome was not built in a day. Very few software projects are, except JavaScript, which was two weeks. But, you know, it was a different time back then. Uh, your calculator should uh, just be able to take whatever numbers you click on, show them in the screen, and then when you click on the equal button, you should see equal pressed down at the bottom, and that's where we are leaving it off. And I will add comments to the rest of this code uh, before I push it up to GitHub. I will get that done at the end of class. That's it. That's all I have for you guys. If you don't have equal press in your console and need help getting caught up, raise your hand, stick around. Otherwise, have an awesome evening, and I will see you guys tomorrow. Jen, what's up? I'm not getting the equal press. You did click the equal button, right? Yeah. Okay. Share your screen. Oh, man. No faith in me, huh? <laughs> You make that mistake He's once, like, and I think you, you learned really your lesson. Did you really click the button? <laughs> um, triple equals equal press capital C in your on click on line twenty six. Oh, awesome. Thank you. No problem. Boas, what's up? Um, my question is about the syntax of that for loop. So it's um, it's for const um, button of all buttons, where, where like we can replace the word button with uh, literally A, B, C, or anything. Um, in the uh, in the snippet itself, mm -hmm. like which one of these keywords button 
is from that declaration and which one is actually referring to the element button. See what um, I mean? Yes. So, um, this button, right? This button and this button are all referencing this button. Okay. The the actual word button up here is only referenced in this get elements by tag name here. Okay. So gotcha. we link from here to here, whatever this returns goes to all buttons here, all buttons here goes into the for loop. And then every time we run through the loop, we dump that into the button and that button we reference here, here, and here. Oh, okay. But like a dot inner HTML, is it not usually suffixed at the end of an element or? It is, this button is an element because it trickled down through our document. Understood, got it. So Perfect. button is an HTML element. It is still having all the DOM properties related with it. The only difference is when we do a get element by ID, it is returning only one of the elements, right? Because it's an ID, it's supposed to be unique. But when we do it by tag name, it's always going to return an array. If it can't find anything, it's gonna return an empty array. If it can only find one thing, it's not gonna return that one thing, it's gonna return that one thing as the only thing in the array. And so because of that, that's why we can loop over that array to get each individual element inside of it. Understood. Thank you. And, and also in that for loop, I don't know if this clarifies it all, but the button there is just a name that we're creating. It could be my button, the button, it could be A, B, C, D, E, F, G. That's just, we're saying const button of all buttons. So that's well, not like a reserved keyword. That's just a variable name there. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm going to rename this to. Not, yeah. For example, if we call it my button or something. Yeah. Then what do we have to change in the. Um, in the code. But um, okay, so but we wouldn't be able to do the for loop on the individual buttons unless we unless we did the um unless we called all buttons um earlier, right? Correct. Okay. Okay. Understood. Perfect. Thank Hopefully you. Hopefully that make sure that didn't break any of my code, but yeah. Yeah, that gets me too when you do button of all buttons and it, use so the same it, word twice just when S on the end of it. I'm like, wait, what's why is it doing? It is a naming convention because the if you think button of buttons is bad, you should see the number of people who do for loops and they use I and you're like, but what is I, right? Like X equals something. I'm like, what does I equal? Well, what gets really bad is when you do a for loop inside of a for loop, which is totally feasible then they go, oh, well, I is already taken, so I'm going to use J. And you literally will have like several for loops deep where it's like index I, J, K. And I'm like, what, what, what the fuck is K? Like, I don't, what is going on here? Um, and so I, when I write professional code, I will never approve a merge request that says for let I equals zero. I always make the person name the index based off of whatever array is that they're looping over. And it drives my developers nuts. And I'm like, I don't care that everyone calls it I. If you get nine for loops deep, sometimes you don't realize you're going to have a loop in a loop. And then all of a sudden you're looking at this code and you have no idea how deep you're going into this and what those those letters are referencing. And so that's why normally I would write this for const button of buttons, but I'm trying to be more uh, more syntactical here and saying, hey, all buttons, and then you're getting access to each individual buttons as you're going through that, right? But if you think about it as like, oh, I've got uh, uh, items on my grocery list. And if I was to go through each one of them, I would call each one of them an item, right? And that's why you get the singular and the plural. Um, but you know, what do you call a group of things? That's going to be your list name with the S. And then what's the singular version to go through each one of them 
that's your singular, singular non-plural word. If you really want to annoy people, you can say individual buttons, and that will still completely work. But now you're talking about one item with an S on it, and that confuses the hell out of people. Computer doesn't care. We do. Ali, I wouldn't say I'm quite at that level, but there is a um, coding challenge that happens uh, at the end of every year in December um, called uh, Advent of Code. And they're all of these like algorithm problems that you, um, they give you some data and they like want you to solve for it. So it's like, how many times did you win this rock, paper, scissors shoot? Uh, and you have to go through and write a for loop to figure out if the if it was one person played paper and the other person played rock, did you win? And if you did keep track of all of that. Um, and what's crazy about it is it's a timed competition. And so Doug got further than me on, on them. I only get up to like the second week and then I tap out because I'm like, this is too much math. This is too like theoretical for me. Like I hit a I hit my limit. Um, but it's timed. And there are people where I write a solution and I'm like, I, the harder ones will take me like two or three hours to do. And it's really fun because it's a, a challenge and they get progressively harder and you get the answer. And it's this like huge moment of satisfaction because the answer is always like one number or one word, or it's like, you're literally taking thousands of lines of data and getting one solution out of it. And you're like, 793, oh my God, the answer is 793. And it makes absolutely no sense. But after three hours of working on it, like you're so glad that you got the right answer. Um, well, anyway, the reason why it's a competition is the challenges are released at 12, at, at midnight and they're timed. And so some people write solutions to this in like two or three lines of code it doesn't even look like JavaScript to me. And they do it in like three minutes and 31 seconds. And it takes me three hours to do it. And I'm like, that's not human. You are not human if you can do that in three minutes. And the problems are all unique. Like there's no way to cheat on this. It's a really secure system. It's like the SAT, they keep it under lock and key until like the, the challenge releases and you looking, you're looking at the time and you're like, that's gotta be hours. Please tell me that's hours and not minutes. It is like ridiculous how some people's minds just work like algorithms and they can write a solution to it really quickly. But I, I look at some people's code because a lot of people publish it on GitHub and uh, I'm just like, absolutely not. I never wanna be that close to a machine that I can write code that quickly. No, yeah, I, I spent I spent days on some of, on some of the problems, you know, and yeah, you see people who and and I've looked up answers on YouTube where I just can't get it. And then I spend days trying to understand their code. <laughs> the The one that I tapped out on was like, oh, the numbers get too big for the computer to keep track of. So you have to use um, like least common denominator factorials. And I was like, nope. Nope, I'm triggered. I haven't done that since high school. Like, no, thank you. I am done. I had my fun. I'm finished. I think I made it to like day 12 or 14, um, somewhere around there and was like, all right, it was fun for two weeks while it lasted. But I, once you have to look up the answers and understand the math in order to be able to program it, I'm just like programming is not fun for me at that point. So I, I just tapped out. So is it easier to like, so is it easier working with like, um, what am I, what am I trying to say here? Is it easier to work with data that's like numerical or data that's actually like is words or is, uh, is some other type of, um, so like, would it easy, be easier to do? Like, let's say you had a library full of books as opposed to like a bank with a bunch of like numbered accounts. It, it depends. It's, um, when you have data that, um, you need like parts of a string. So let's say, for example, 
um, you wanted to know the average copyright year of all the books in your library, but the copyright was stored as like C2022 Random House Inc., right? That is a little bit harder to work with because you need to be able to extract the number from the string so that you can actually average it together. So there is certainly some data that you need to do what they call data sanitization, where you go through and you clean up the data or you have to write an algorithm itself to extract out the number that you're looking for from the, the string. Um, and there are certainly data sets that are better organized than others, which makes it easier to do analyses on them. Um, but the fun part of advent of code is that the the guy who writes it is a is like a puzzle writer. And so when he writes the problem, there's there's no ambiguity in terms of understanding what the data is trying to represent. And then they always show like a little snippet of it. Um, I don't know. Um, Advent um, login. So this is a really good one to like, if you are trying to test your JavaScript knowledge, um, but I would say wait until like the end of the, the JavaScript, but um, on this first one, um, you have to find um, what elf is carrying the most calories, right? And so you have to process through this data and say, well, this elf is carrying 6,000 calories because there's a, a line break. And then you go down and go, oh, this elf is only carrying 4,000, so 6,000 is still the most, oh, this elf is carrying 11,000 calories because five plus six, the new line break, you add that together, you have to find the maximum. And they do a really good job of explaining what I just did so that you like understand the puzzle input. Um, and then they're like, okay, now, now go get the input or, or go do that with this data. And you open the data and it's literally like thousands of lines. And the reason why they do this is there's no way as a human, you would go through and add all of those numbers together. So they purposely make the puzzle input so that only a computer would be able to solve that. So you wouldn't be able to do it by hand. Um, and then it gets more advanced from there. So this is a great, a great puzzle one. Um, the last one that I got to was 11. Uh, and that was the least common denominator one. That one was a pain. Um, yeah, they get really, they get really complicated. One of them was like, there are treetops and you need to figure out which treetop has the best view looking outside, depending on the height of other trees. Um, and so this puzzle input was, um, was like that. And that looks nuts, but that's the fun part of like reading this as the puzzle input and understanding it on this little data set and then being able to try and get your code to solve that. Um, I, I, I know it sounds nuts, but I do have my, uh, <laughs> uh, I do have all of my solutions up until day 11, which is all that I got to. Um, but you can see, like, I saw this with JavaScript, and you can see me putting in my comments and going through it and making sure that, you know, you, you have a rough idea of how it works. But here's a for loop, here's an if statement, you know, it's solving an, a real life data set. Um, and most of these things are with numbers, but not always. Um, the rock, paper, scissor one. was all A was for rock and Z was for, or it was A, B, C for rock, paper, scissors. And then if the opponent played A, B, or X, Y, Z, that's, that was their rock, paper, scissors. This one was so maddening because as soon as you got the solution, it's like the elf, there's two parts to every day's problem. And the second problem is, the elf came back and told you that you made a wrong assumption and A actually represents like this completely other thing. And you have to go back through and like rewrite all of your algorithms. So um, 
I like ad- Advent's a weird thing for me. I really like Advent until it hits a point, and then I'm like, fuck this, I'm tired. I see the code in there is all looking like the same color. It's not like ours, different colors and stuff, which is a lot easier to read. When we get out of this boot camp, like, is it all just going to go black and white for us? And we're... It's black and white in GitHub, but if you download the files in GitHub and open them in VS Code, it will bring back all the color. Okay. Ooh, a little scary. Yeah, you do get used to that syntax highlighting, and then it becomes much harder to, to read that code. Yeah, that happens. But as long as you open it back in your text editor, the text editor brings all that color back for you. All right. Have a great night. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Night.